G, we can make that possible. The gentleman's time has expired. Thank you very much, Mr. Secretary, uh, for your testimony. Of course, and now uh, you may be excused. Now we call upon our second panel. They got a list. Yeah, you, if you have not had a chance to question. The second, witness, the second witness for today's hearing is former Treasury Secretary under the Bush Administration, uh, Secretary Henry Paulson. Uh, Mr. Paulson, please uh, stand as I administer the oath. Do you solemnly swear to tell the truth and nothing but the truth? If so, answer in the affirmative. Right. You may be seated. Let the record reflect that he answered in the affirmative. I will ask the witness to summarize his testimony in five minutes and, of course, we know the procedure, you know, the yellow light means you have a minute left and the red light means stop and then, of course, we will have time to uh, raise questions with you. You know the procedure. You have been through this quite a few times, so uh, good to have you back. Mr. Chairman, <clears throat> thank you and I will uh, go through this quickly. Uh, first of all, Chairman Towns, Ranking Member Issa and distinguished members of the committee. I appreciate the invitation to testify before this committee. I was Secretary of the Treasury in 2008. In that role, I had the privilege to work with many talented men and women in government and the private sector who labored to pull our nation back from the brink of disaster. The decision to rescue AIG was correct and I strongly supported it. An AIG failure would have been devastating to the financial system and to the economy. Today's hearing relates to payments to AIG's credit default swap counterparties. I was not involved in any of the decisions made with respect to those payments, nor was I involved in any of the decisions about AIG's public disclosure of those payments. Those matters were handled by the Federal Reserve Bank of New York and the Federal Reserve Board. They sought to make appropriate decisions on those matters, and I am confident that this review will show that they did. I have limited knowledge on the topics of immediate interest to the committee, but I will share the following observations. The rescue of AIG was necessary, and I believe that we in the government who acted to rescue it, including Secretary Geithner, Chairman Bernanke and me, acted properly and in the best interest of our country. The reasons the rescue of AIG was necessary are well worth examining. I believe they are representative of the causes of other aspects of the crisis and indicate where regulatory reform is necessary. There are three reasons we needed to save AIG that stand out in my mind. First, AIG was incredibly large and interconnected. It had one trillion, a one trillion dollar balance sheet a massive derivatives business that connected it to hundreds of financial institutions, businesses and governments, tens of millions of life insurance customers, and tens of billions of dollars of contracts guaranteeing the retirement savings of individuals. If AIG collapsed, it would have buckled our financial system and wrought economic havoc on the lives of millions of our citizens. Second, AIG was seriously underregulated. Although many of AIG's subsidiaries, including its insurance companies, were subject to varying levels of regulation, the parent entity was, for all practical purposes, an unregulated holding company. Consequently, there was no single regulator with a complete picture of AIG 
or a comprehensive understanding of how it was run. It was not until AIG started to fail that regulators began to understand how badly managed it had been and how much the toxic aspects of parts of its business had infected otherwise healthy parts. Third, AIG could not be effectively wound down. Unlike failed depository institutions, which can be taken over by the FDIC with little or no harm to depositors, or the GSEs, which were seamlessly placed into conservatorship by Treasury and the Federal Housing Finance Agency, there was and is no resolution authority available to wind down a failing institution like AIG. The only option is bankruptcy, a process that is simply not capable of protecting the millions of Americans whose finances are intertwined with AIG's. The government rescue of AIG in the fall of 2008 was directly shaped by these realities. We had to protect the economy and the finances of millions of Americans. We could not have anticipated the magnitude of AIG's problems and we had no way of letting it fail without disastrous collateral consequences. We had to intervene and I'm thankful we did. I do not mean to say that I'm happy we needed to intervene. Taxpayer money should not have to be spent to save a misguided and mismanaged enterprise. But the fundamental problem lies not in how we intervened, but why we needed to intervene. We need to modernize our regulatory structure by creating a systemic, systemic risk regulator and resolution authority so any large firm that fails can be liquidated without destabilizing the system. Large financial institutions in this country will always play a role that is essential to our economic growth, but they must only be permitted to grow and interconnect throughout our economy under careful oversight and with a mechanism for allowing those connections to be broken safely. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you um, uh, very much for your, your testimony. Uh, let me say that you were deeply and aggressively involved in dealing with the financial crisis. And uh, uh, we saw that with AIG, of course, and Bank of America, and, and with the TARP. My question is, why did you sit on the sideline uh, and, and not use your considerable influence to call the CEOs of the uh, counterparties and to get them to take a haircut? I mean, why wouldn't you do that? I mean, you you a person that was uh, very influential in all of this, you know, uh, uh, and I can understand why you wouldn't do that. Well, M Mr. Chairman, as you indicated, I had no involvement uh, at all in the, uh, the the payment to the counterparties, no involvement whatsoever. Now, to, to explain this, we worked very collaboratively during during the crisis. There was a lot going on, uh, coming at us from all sides, and whichever agency had the authorities took responsibility for execution. And this was clearly a case. It was a Federal Reserve loan. They had the authorities to make it and administer it and they had the technical expertise to, uh, to, do, to do the restructuring. But, you know, uh, I just see it a little strange that you would sit on the sideline and not help the American people in terms of, uh, I mean, you were so involved in the early stages and you were, I mean, and throughout the process. Mr. And then Chairman. to sit on the sideline at a time like this, I, I, I just find Mr. Chairman, that. Mr. Chairman, anybody that knows me know I was not sitting on the sideline. I was, I, I was not involved in this issue, but I was involved in many other issues every single day of the week, uh, in, including weekends. So I, I didn't spend uh, Why not? I mean, why wouldn't you be involved in this? Because this was a Federal Reserve loan. They had the authority. They had the technical expertise. And, and, I was, and I said in my testimony, I have great confidence in the, the professionalism, professionalism, the integrity, the motives, the abilities of the people that were, that were handling this. So this was their job to handle, and I was working on many other things which were in my bailiwick. Let me ask another question then. Um, 
why wouldn't you um, uh, let AIG go into bankruptcy? Why, why not? Uh, if, if AIG had failed, this was a huge financial organization, interconnections throughout the economy. If it had failed, with the system as fragile as it was, I believe it would have taken down the you whole... Talk back into the microphone. They're having problems I believe problems it would have taken you. down the whole financial system and our economy. It would have been a disaster. Today, after all the actions that have been taken by the U.S. government, we still have this terrible 10 percent unemployment level. I believe that if the system had come down and failed, we could easily have had unemployment reaching or exceeding the 25 percent level we had in the Great Depression. We would have lost uh, many additional billions of dollars in uh, American savings. Uh, home prices would be much lower than they are today. So as unattractive as the government rescue of AIG was, and none of us that supported that found that to be an attractive or desirable option, it was just much, much better than the alternative, which would have been economic disaster in this country. Right. Um, I now yield uh, five minutes to the gentleman from California, the ranking member. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I would ask that we go to the members who did not have an opportunity in the first round. And, and Mr. Chairman, I would also ask us one thing. Will you agree, since the Secretary said he would answer our questions, to join with me in ensuring that all questions are answered or that we bring the uh, Secretary back, uh, assuming he does not answer them for some reason? So ordered. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Lukermeyer would be next to those waiting. Thank you, Mr. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Paulson, um, one of the things that we are looking into here with the AIG, can you explain to me, is AIG and their financial products, was, was that a subsidiary of AIG or was that uh, part of their business model? I, I believe it was part of the, uh, the, the business model. There wasn't a separate entity that was separately capitalized? It was, I, it was, it, it was clearly, uh, it was clearly at, at the holding company and it was, it was a, uh, it was part of. It, I think it, makes, part, it, was, it wasn't part of an insurance business model, but it was sure part of the uh, of the company's business strategy. Because it makes a big difference if it's not part of the insurance part of the company and it's a subsidiary that's separately capitalized. You can let that thing go down; and it doesn't impact the insurance part of it, which I believe it was. Is that not correct? Well, I would say this to you: this com company was so big and intertwined that it was. If, if there was any way that the people who were working on this could have found a way to just hive off and let one small part of the company uh, it, go with down. With the gentleman suspend, uh, Mr. Paulson, excuse me, uh, we want to make sure that members right. can hear your testimony. And, you know, the, it's okay. amazing with so much money in this federal government, we don't have a better sound system. But okay. I'm going to need you to speak as closely to that mic as you can so everyone okay. can hear you. Thank you. You make so, it. So to, to just be. To, to just be clear, there, there was no way to, to, to hive off and, and handle the situation uh, differently. There was a very few days to act to prevent bankruptcy with no wind down p powers to l let, let this company be liquidated and, and avoid bankruptcy. Well, with all due respect, if it's a separate entity, a subsidiary, it could go down and the rest of it could still stand I, on its own, sir. But uh, I, that being I, I another, could, let, me ask, let me move on here with another question very quickly. Uh, in, in, in uh, Secretary Geithner's uh, testimony, he indicated that he felt that contractually uh, the, the contracts that we had, with the, the investments that were made by foreign banks into AIG that they were involved with, need to be uh, uh, adhered to and and and, uh, and worked with. Was was the, was the government a part of those contracts? I, as I've said in, in my testimony, I had no involvement with. With the payment of any of those contracts, I just was not involved in so, that matter. So the government wasn't a party of the contracts then. What? <coughs> the government wasn't a party of the again, contracts. Again, this was this was not something that I was directly involved in. I've said that I uh, very much trust the motives and the abilities and the judgments of the people that made those decisions, but but I wasn't party to them, and I I, I can't uh, 
uh, can't okay. answer that question. Well, that's one of the frustrations, and I appreciate your, your candor, but it's my frustration with the chair and that we don't get full testimony and be able to get all the questions answered, ask, ask and then answer so we can come to you with, with what we feel is good information to be able to get some, some good back and forth here. So I apologize to you. Let me move on to something else. I know right now we're looking at, and the President's proposed some uh, too big to fail uh, sort of uh, strategies to try and uh, address the issue of too big to fail. Uh, where, where are you in this de debate? What do you think about the proposal that's on the table right now, sir? Well, when I was uh, Secretary of the Treasury, I put out a regulatory blueprint, and I still believe that that, 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 that is a way to go. I am uh, very, uh, I think it's essential that we have wind down authorities, resolution authorities, so that any financial organization, no matter how big, can be liquidated outside of the bankruptcy process without taking down the rest of the economy. And so I think that is essential, and there are, <coughs> there are some uh, parts uh, of, uh, of, the, uh, of the proposals that are up here being debated by Congress, which are the same as in the regulatory blueprint we put forward. A big one being the systemic risk regulator, and I'm uh, strongly in favor of a systemic risk regulator. Do you, do you believe that we need to take the the, the uh, risk uh, investments that are part of some of many of the big banks right now and take them off the books and set up a subsidiary for this, so we can I, sort of have go back to a glass steagall firewall there? I th th that is not my re recommendation. I, I I believe that when you look at the at the crisis, what I saw in the crisis was it, it was across a number of financial types of financial institutions, and the the excess of risk taking I saw was not limited to one business activity. It was much broader than that, and I think we need a broader approach. And so again, what I favor is a systemic risk regulator and wind down authorities is the way I would handle that. Well, one of the problems I have with that, with what you're suggesting, sir, is that suddenly now we have the taxpayers through FDIC insurance on the hook for these risk takers who are out here. Uh, I think it's important that we take these things off the books and have a separate consider that if it goes down, it goes down and the, and, the F, and the banks and the insurance funds and the taxpayers as a whole are not on the hook for all this. I think it's very important we go down that road because I think what you've done with with AIG is suddenly used the federal government as the official underwriter of all investments in the world. If we're underwriting foreign contracts, investments, what have we done? We've gone down that road. And I, I'm, I appreciate your comments, and I yield Gen back to the chair. Gentlemen's time's expired. Uh, chair, uh, in keeping with the uh, uh, necessity of making sure the members who do not ask questions in the last round are given a chance to go first, uh, we recognize Mr. Tierney. Thank you for your patience, and you may proceed for five Thank minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Paulson, thank you for being here this morning. Uh, so you were in full agreement with not allowing AIG to go bankrupt? A absolutely. Okay. So I, I think back home people don't know where to give the credit for this, so I, I want to make sure we give credit where credit is due if that was a good decision. Uh, you know, people see Mr. Geithner uh, now as treasurer, and I think that the decisions were all made by him when he was treasurer. In fact, these were decisions made in 2008. Uh, you were uh, President Bush's Secretary of the Treasury, correct? Absolutely. And, and uh, Mr. Bernanke was the uh, head of the Fed. And then, of course, we had the New York Federal Reserve Board participating in these conversations as well. So that's you know, pretty much the group that decided that uh, they should give $85 billion in September to AIG. Those are mostly the participants, am I right? Yeah, we were, as I said in my testimony, I very much supported that, uh, right. th that rescue. Okay. And then in November, uh, it was the same group. Uh, you as uh, President Bush's Secretary of the Treasury, Mr. Bernanke, and the New York Fed decided to give additional funds to AIG, some of which were used to pay uh, the counterparties to the contracts, right? Yes. In, in November, uh, in, in the TARP, we made a, a, a $40 billion capital investment, and then the Fed put some additional money in to uh, uh, which was which was used up for the contracts. Well, and just so we're clear, we're giving credit here. The TARP, the seven hundred billion dollars of TARP, in fact, was uh, during your term as Secretary of the Treasury oh, under yeah, President I'm not, Bush. I'm, 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 I'm proud of that. So okay, that's, and that was your idea, was it? The TARP. That was there was a number of our ideas, but yes, and that's something I'm proud of, and it's something that was very necessary. And the eighty-five billion dollars uh, that was loaned to AIG was not appropriated by Congress. Nobody asked Congress to make a vote on that. Am I right? <laughs> 
No, no, that was a decision taken by the Fed with the support of. And what it. money? What source of money did they use to get that eighty-five billion? Uh, they, 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 they use their funds. And their funds emanate from where? From the U.S. government. Well, were they fees from other banks? Were they? Uh, they come from your Treasury. Where do they come? They they come from the the, the, the Fed. Obviously, can print money. Okay, and. Did they take money that they had from fees charged to member banks, or did they print money to accommodate this $85 billion? You, you, you'd have to ask the Fed that. All right. You're not aware during any discussions where I, that was? I'd like them to, to answer that question. Well, I, I, you may not like to answer the question, no, sir, but I, if you know the information, I'm asking I, I you to say, share with us what, I, you are, what is your best understanding of where my, that money my, came my, from. My best understanding is all dollars are green, so those are ultimately taxpayer dollars. And that was why we are painfully aware that they are taxpayer th th dollars. Th th that, w that was why the, the Treasury was supportive and right. we, uh, we, we were very supportive of that transaction. Okay. We all understand that the full faith and, and uh, yeah. promise comes to the government on that, the taxpayer dollars were painfully aware. But I am asking you whether, since they didn't come to Congress for an appropriation, whether the $85 billion came from fees charged to member banks was newly printed money or some combination of the both? It, 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 I don't believe it came from uh, fees charged from member banks. All right. Thank you. Uh, now, we got to the point where a decision had to be made about whether or not to let AIG go bankrupt. Uh, later, it came to a point whether or not to pay the, the uh, counterparties 100 percent uh, on those contracts or not. But once the decision made not to let them go bankrupt, you lost any leverage, really, to argue uh, in terms of getting, uh, to being able to pay less than 100 percent. Is that a fair statement? As I said, I didn't uh, participate in, the, uh, in, in those decisions regarding well, payment, and I, I also said we didn't have the wind-down powers. Okay. But, you know, you were involved with, I think, I forget how many uh, Congressman Kaptur said that there were phone calls between the New York Fed and you, some uh, 225. 225 telephone conversations between the head of the New York Fed and you during this period of time. So I think we might be fair in assuming that you were discussing some of these matters? Well, we had, we had many matters to discuss. And this was one uh, of them, Over right? a range of things. And, and the matters we discussed, we clearly discussed the rescue. Uh, yes. As I said, I did not have involvement and was here's, not discussing. Here is my final question. I need your help with this. Most people at home hear people draw the conclusion that not to allow AIG to go into bankruptcy would have been devastating because the consequences would have been severe. It would be enormously helpful if you could put yourself in the position of the uh, local uh, bookkeeper for a, a medical firm or housekeeper or lawyer or teacher's aide, how specifically would that individual have been harmed if you had not made the decision to not allow AIG to go bankrupt? What would have been the consequence to them? And, and, and that's the right question, Congressman, because they were the real victims. They would have lost jobs, would have lost. But how? How would that have happened? To show me from the time you made the decision what would have spiraled down to affect their lives? Well, uh, the gentleman's time has expired, uh, uh, but the witness uh, w would be pleased to answer his question, I hope. Uh, okay. What I believe, we, we were at, at, at around the time of the AIG rescue, when markets were frozen, we had a situation in this country where even blue chip industrial companies were having trouble financing. I knew we were on the brink that if AIG had gone down, I believe that we would have had a situation where main street companies, industrial companies of all size, would not have been able to raise money for their basic f funding. And they wouldn't have been able to pay their employees. They would have had to let them go. Employees wouldn't have paid their bills. This would have rippled through the economy. The today, Congressman, we have, after everything that was done, all the resources, we have 10 percent unemployment. I believe we easily would have had 25 percent unemployment. Today, we have uh, home prices that have dropped precipitously in some parts of the country. Home prices would have gone much lower. AIG guaranteed tens of billions of dollars of savings for uh, retirement savings for Americans. There would have been great losses. This would have been an economic nightmare. Thank you, Mr. Paulson. Thank you no, for the chair answer. recognizes Mr. Souter. Thank you. I have got a variation of the same uh, question you were just going through, because one of the, the problems we have is, is that it appears that AIG was treated differently than other uh, 
companies throughout this whole thing in this sense, that the holders of the debt were paid at par, uh, which means that, the, the, in effect, uh, the banks got 100 percent, but, for example, GM creditors, uh, small businesses all across America, uh, and in other uh, uh, companies that were let go, they got 10 cents on the dollar, 30 cents on the dollar, and it's part of a, a fact, but a, a perception that that was unfair, that Wall Street was covered but Main Street wasn't in, in debt. Now, AIG was different in what sense? Now, I know, uh, it, it was it 120 separate finance companies in 80 insurance, or is that flip, something like that? In other words, it was a collection, it wasn't one. It was a big one. complex collection of companies, correct. And that if the insurance divisions were separated and, and came under state, part of the argument is state regulation, that they were so intertwined with the finance. But uh, let me ask one other question before we get into details of that. You said bankruptcy wasn't an option, um, but it also meant that did you try to put pressure on the people who held the debt to write down some of their debt, or d once you made the statement we weren't going to let it fail, were they just playing hardball and saying we weren't going to write down anything, why didn't they get the same pressure that GM suppliers had and everybody else to write down their debt? Uh, as I've said, and this isn't me t t trying to suggest anything w w was done wrong, I had nothing to do with that. So I, I, I was not involved in the negotiation. I was not involved in anything surrounding those payments. But I will explain one thing to you, which is fundamental for, for you to understand, is the government, we have an antiquated regulatory system and a lack of the necessary authorities. And so if there was a bank, there was a, there is a way to wind that down. But this was, this was a non-bank and, Just, and there was... I understand that. Let me read There's no way to avoid Let me ask you, there's no way except the threat of real bankruptcy. And that if you're a bank, and think you can negotiate at par and get a full percent and you don't have a threat of bankruptcy, the question is, is did anybody threaten them? Did anybody say that if we're not going to, I mean, did we in effect yield the debate at the beginning, they played hardball and we had no way to do it, uh, that uh, if in fact uh, you would have even threatened to say, hey, we can cover the insurance people, but the finance side over here, you better negotiate down or that side will go bankrupt and then you'd wind up probably having to do what we did in TARP anyway, which is put cash reserves into the banking system to try to cover the fact that the bankruptcy went out. Would that not be true? In other words, had they gone bankrupt and there really was a catastrophic threat, which I believe because I voted for TARP, uh, that um, a catastrophic threat, wouldn't you have just had to put more money in the banking system but not necessarily at par? As I said, uh, Congressman, I didn't... Uh as I said, I, I, I wasn't involved in that, so I, I can't. You're comment. saying the New York Fed. Did I, that. I can't comment beyond what I've said. That at, at some when when you got involved, once TARP was there, the decision was already made that it wasn't going to go bankrupt. Is that correct? When I, when I well, for first of all, I was involved in supporting the initial rescue, and then. So you were involved. Just a second. You were involved, and did yes, you advise the Fed to try to get what they could and not do pay well, at par? Well, what the Fed, the, the initial rescue was not the it was not when they dealt with the the payment to counterparties. So I was supported the Fed on the initial loan, and then uh, l later in November, the situation had deteriorated to the point. And values in insurance businesses all around the world had deteriorated to the point that this was a company that would go down without capital. And so now we had capital, and, and my team and I participated in, in making that decision, made the decision to put $40 billion of equity into AIG. Uh, the, the problem that, that I have is it appears to me that AIG was treated differently so, so much so, even listening to that, it's like, well, we, we, we put some money in initially and then we put more money in because they couldn't fail where in the other, everything from Citibank to Merrill Lynch to everything else, there were processes where there were conditions on money coming in, where there were uh, guidelines on money coming in and they used the leverage of the threat of bankruptcy. To, to do that, then, then in this case it appears that it was different and it partly is that the creditors are different. For, furthermore, the, the, uh, 
that some of the critical information here was withheld from being uh, public at, at the request of the New York Fed, that had that been public, people would have seen it. And there was an attempt to even keep it quieter because that was critical, that information, to understand what was going on behind. And it's, it, that, that it is extremely frustrating to all of us on this committee, and you can hear it in different types of questions, uh, about how this came to be, and that we, the, the I don't think there's been a, a compelling case made the that AIG time is unique. Has expired. Thank you. But I would say that if Mr. Paulson wants to respond uh, to the gentleman, you may do so, and if not, we'll go to the next I, I question. Have no response, sir. Okay. I thank the gentleman. Uh, Chair recognizes Mr. Kanjorski. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Welcome back, Mr. Paulson. You, you really miss Washington, I assume. <laughs> uh, you can't guess how much. <laughs> I, I, those, I, I, I listened to the comments of the Secretary, your, your successor, and now you, and I'm listening to the members' questions and how much memory is lost in a year or 14 months from those fateful days in September and October, which all of us hope we never relive, but in fact were very much significantly different than today, and the coolness of being able to answer. One of the questions I was particularly interested in, because I was very involved at that time with AIG and what was happening from uh, my aspect of having some jurisdiction over insurance, is that, as I understand it, because of fa uh, financial products in London was without assets and had a tremendous involvement in counterparty positions of about $2.8 trillion, and whose counterparty positions were starting to fail and they had to honor them their initial internal decision of AIG was to use the assets of the world's largest insurance company. And they sought permission and uh, it was pending and finally approved by their regulator, the State of New York, to take assets out of the insurance uh, companies, about $30 billion, and use those assets to, to cover their exposed counterparty positions. Uh, now, if that had happened at that time, those insurance companies would have failed because their assets would have been taken, converted, and they wouldn't have been enough to cover the counterparty position, so it would have wiped out the insurance companies, which in turn would have affected every insurance holder in the country that was involved with AIG at the time and would have been a catastrophic collapse of the insurance industry, uh, and not, notwithstanding the counterparty and, and derivative position. Now, luckily, uh, the regulator in the state of New York didn't grant his permission to use that $30 million until much later when it was futile. And at that point, the losses on the counterparty positions, I think, rose to $55 billion and were climbing on a daily basis. And that's when the infusion of funds that you talk about adding equity to AIG or the capacity through the use of government funds to cover those counterparty losses. They didn't cover all those losses, and subsequently, within probably 30 days, another huge amount of money was infused into AIG's various corporate structures to get some st stability. And not that I could say nothing has changed from that, but that was the, in, uh, the significant circumstances in this uh, month or two months after September 18th that everybody was faced with. But as I understand it, the Federal Reserve was, was the person with the checkbook under the instance, under 313 powers. They were just plugging that money in. And it wasn't a decision made at the Secretary's level of Treasury or at the presidential level. It was a Federal Reserve regulator level that was making that decision. And I dare say regulator not for AIG, but regulator that had regulation over some of the largest banking institutions in the world, that if they had been not, if their counterparty positions weren't honored, they would have immediately collapsed. And that's what we were calling the meltdown. Everything was going to implode. And, and, and you had to stop it at the headwaters, not wait until it got out into, to the little dams out in the stream. Is that relatively the correct position? I would say without signing off on every fact you mentioned, I would say you've got it in the sense that there was, this was a very complex company and there was, if, if it had gone into bankruptcy, it would have been a huge mess and it would have, it would have, uh, one part of the company would have contaminated the other and it would have rippled through the U.S. economy and, and the result would have been absolute disaster. 
Mr. Chairman, I know there are other questioners. I've had the opportunity to ask them today, so I yield back the balance of my time. I uh, thank the gentleman for his courtesy. Uh, before uh, I, I recognize uh, Mr. Uh, Bacchus, I want to take the liberty as chair to um, recognize students from Padua French Franciscan High School in Parma, Ohio, or visiting uh, the Capitol and uh, seeing their government at work right here. So welcome, uh, you and your teacher, and we're pleased that you stopped by for a visit. Thank you. The uh, chair recognizes Mr. Barkas of Alabama. Uh, welcome, former Secretary. Uh, Secretary Paulson, um, March 2009, you know, September, uh, March 16th was when uh, AIG was the payments were made to AIG or, or guarantee. Um, leading up to that, you, were, you participated in uh, several meetings uh, about AIG, is that correct? Prior to March of... of 2009? Prior to March, yeah, I had a number of meetings uh, about AIG as we were putting in capital. I know one of the meetings, uh, I'm looking at March 24th, my questioning of, of Mr. Geithner, he mentions, uh, Secretary Geithner, that you, uh, he said that uh, he and you met with AIG to discuss Lehman's failure. Discuss what? Uh, September 14th. Now that was two days before. Oh, oh yeah, yes. You're saying, so I, I, you were talking about 2009. Right. March and I think you're talking about September 14th, uh, t 2008. That's right. Okay. All right. I've, and I I stand corrected. I am. Uh, that discussion, uh, but you you participated in some of the discussions about AIG and their financial condition leading e up to e yes. In uh, the, the, the the weekend of September 13th and 14th was a weekend when we were uh, uh, had financial institutions together working to come up with a solution to prevent the failure of Lehman. And it was that weekend that we learned also about AIG. And I had uh, two meetings over the course of that weekend at the New York Fed with Tim Geithner, with, with uh, officials from AIG. Right. Uh in those meetings, was there any discussion of, of uh, asking the counterparties to take less than 100 percent? Was there any discussion of what? Any discussion of the counterparties taking less than 100 percent? I, I sure don't recall any. We were talking about the financial problems that, uh, that, uh, that, that AIG had, and it was clearly, they, had, they clearly had issues with counterparties. Right. What? what? Uh, they, they clearly had issues with counterparties because that was the, the, the crux of the issue was uh, what was a ratings, a potential uh, uh, ratings downgrade, which would cause uh, the company to have to post collateral. And so and so that would lead to uh, to so, so their obligation to the counterparties was discussed. Well, well, obviously that was the uh, the, the 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 issue. Any 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 institution that is facing failure sure. is, is going to have an issue with paying uh, paying creditors. Sure. I'm not. Uh, you know, once that intervention occurred, then the the really the taxpayers, the U.S. government, owned 79.8 percent of AIG. Uh, more or less, I guess, is that correct, isn't it? Yep. Uh, that being the case, I, I see in this same 3-15-2009, now this is skipping forward to March of 2009, uh, Secretary Geithner uh, emailed William Dudley and Edward Quince and he said, where are you on the AIG counterparty <coughs> disclosure issue? Um, you know, are you for disclosing or not now? Uh, would the gentleman the yield? Could, could you put up slide one, please, so they could see it? Thank you. Uh, what would your advice have been on whether or not that should have been a public disclosure of, uh, of the counterparties and their obligations? And would the fact that, that really the taxpayers own 
over 79 percent, almost 80 percent of the company have made any different? Well, a as a general proposition, I'm very much for disclosure, uh, but I wasn't part of this. I had nothing to do with that decision, and I am not going to sit here now and second guess others that were, uh, you know, that I know people with, sure. with, with strong integrity and, and, and goodwill trying right. to do the right thing. Well, just <clears throat> take a situation where, the, where you do have a company that's, you know, 80 percent owned by the U.S. government. Uh, would that would that uh, tend to make you think that they that there ought to be disclosure of their obligations? Well, but, but public companies. Uh, the the have, gentleman. Uh, public uh, companies. Time is expired. Mr. Paulson, the gentleman's time has expired, but you can answer his question. I'll, I'll be brief. But, but public companies have disclosure obligations, and that's governed by the SEC. And, and I think those are that those need to be adhered to. Thank. You. Okay, I, uh, I thank the gentleman. The uh, chair recognizes uh, Mr. Cummings of Maryland. You may proceed. Mr. Paulson, good seeing you again. Let me ask you this. Mr. Paulson, do you, do you, um, do you realize that uh, a lot of the American people believe that there's uh, a sort of Wall Street club and that, let me, let me finish, that you all play golf together and you have a lot of fun and then you, you know, when the billions come around, you're able to kind of distribute them. I mean, I, I'm just saying, do you know that that's how people feel? I, I, I sure do. And uh, even though Can you I'm, keep your voice up? I said, even though I'm not a golfer, I sure know that's how people feel. Yeah, and they, and they, when they see these deals going on, then the, the next thing they do is they begin to look at where people worked. And then they see the relationships, and then they say, well, you know, we don't have a chance because it seems like they're kind of looking out for, for themselves, but not looking out for us. And so, you know, you, you just gave a statement about transparency, and, um, you know, they, and I think one of the things that bothers people is when they don't see transparency, then they begin not to trust. And when they begin not to trust, it becomes very difficult for them to go along with any program. And then when you put on top of that, that they can't see themselves benefiting. And I know that you mentioned that if, if we didn't do what we did, and unemployment may have gone up to 25 percent, but it's hard for people to even see that. You, you understand? Yeah, I, uh, Congressman, you've got it. And that's, uh, people are very, very angry and I understand it, why they're angry, and they're rightfully so, because they don't see the connection. Uh, and, and they don't recognize that what was done wasn't done for the banks. It was to, to it, 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 they, they were going to be the victims if, yeah. if, if we didn't step in. And so among the conditions in the top AIG, SSFI, Investment Senior Preferred Stock and Warrant Summary of Senior Preferred Terms, as posted on Treasury's Department's website, the following condition is noted. Quote, the annual bonus pools payable to senior partners in respect of each of 2008 and 2009 shall not exceed the average of the annual bonus pools paid to senior partners for 2006 and 2007. Do you believe it was appropriate for Treasury to allow AIG to create any bonus pool for senior partners considering it had just found it necessary to extend $40 billion to the firm through the TARP. I'm not going to get into uh, second-guessing decisions that were made at, at, at Treasury about bonuses. I realize this was, a, this was a very difficult decision because the taxpayer had a lot of money in this company. Right. And this company needed to perform well and needed to hold the team together to, in order to repay tax. Uh, right, repay and, tax and, and the taxpayers were saying to themselves, look, these are our tax dollars. Uh, we worked hard for these tax dollars, and now these guys who screwed up everything are, are getting bonuses. Yeah, you're right. No one, me included, likes to see private business profit from taxpayer assistance. That makes people angry. And to me, I just hope that part of that anger is 
is, is not a diversion from what we need to do, but is an incentive to fix the system so that we'll have resolution powers and never again will we'll have a company that's so big, too big to fail, so the taxpayer has to come and put money in, that, that a company can be liquidated and wound down in a way in which the taxpayer is not on the hook again. Mm -hmm. But so I understand there's that anger out there and that frustration. I think it's very understandable. And uh, I think there's a number of ways to do something about it, but the best way to do something about it is reform the system so that, uh, that we don't uh, ever again have to, to bail out a big institution, rescue a big institution. It can be liquidated if it fails. Now, the, with regard to the original Treasury TARP investment in AIG, was this structured as a loan or as an equity investment? Uh, uh, Congressman, it was an equity investment. And was this in the AIG parent holding company or in the individual subsidiaries? This was this was in 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 the in the parent. This was a this was a forty billion dollar uh, equity investment because a company needed equity. And was it made subordinate to any other creditors of AIG? Well, a a preferred is by definition uh, senior to the common and and subordinated to the other creditors. And how does this compare to the various Federal Reserve investments in AIG? Well, th this would be, th this, this is subordinate to the other Federal Reserve uh, investments in AIG because a determination was made. The rating agencies basically said that you need to put capital in this institution or there will be a downgrade and then it would have, it would have precipitated the failure. And why was it structured in this way? It, it, it was structured in that way because that's the way it preferred uh, needs to be structured. That's where it, that, it wouldn't have been capital if it, if it hadn't been subordinated to the, other, uh, to, to, the, to the other liabilities. I see my time is up. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank, I thank the gentleman. Chair recognizes Mr. Stearns from Florida. You may proceed for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Paulson, uh, Mr. Geithner has testified that he recused himself during this counterparty negotiation. Did you know that while you were Secretary of Treasury? I knew that. Just yes or no? Yes. You I, did I, know. Okay. I, he, did you know Tim that Geithner he did, did not sign? did not participate in any I didn't view him as a decision maker. I viewed okay. him as recused. Did he call you up and advise you that I've recused myself? Did he call you up? He, he, How did he, he notify you? Well, he, 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 he told me on the phone that he did not think it would be appropriate for him to be okay. viewed as a decision maker. Did you know maker? he never got a letter? All he did, he testified that he recused himself. He decided. He put up a flag and said, I recuse myself. I'm not going to be involved with a counterparty negotiation. Didn't get a, like you went to the White House counsel and you went to the Secretary of Treasury, you, get a, you got a letter. He never got a letter. He never got a written confirmation of his recusal. Did you know that? Do you know that he was just doing it on his own by his own volition? I did not know the details. Okay. Did you think a, a person who would recuse himself in this crisis we had, that he could go about and operate in his present job and not have a conflict of interest? Did you ever occur to yourself to say, gee, the chairman of the Federal Reserve is in this crisis, we're having the counterparty negotiations, and by golly, he's going to step aside and says he knows nothing about it. That's what he's saying today. Doesn't that seem sort of fakey to you? I, I, no, it didn't, because I thought it was an extraordinary position we had to have a president of the okay, New York I Treasury. Now, so now the I thought question. it was a he reasonable. He said in open testimony that his chief of staff, while he was chairman of the Federal Reserve, was a former employee, employee of Goldman Sachs. Did you know that? Yes. Did you ever call the chief of staff, his chief of staff, former employee of Goldman Sachs, during the process of the counterparty negotiations, did you ever call? If I go to the logs, will I see your name calling him? The, uh, his chief of staff, uh, who was a former uh, uh, employee of Goldman Sachs. And he worked did, for you did, when did, you were didn't, CEO. He didn't take on that job until after I had left and he had become Treasury Secretary. Do you think that, do you think, did you ever call him at all? If I go back to logs, will I find that you called Geithner's chief of staff, former employee of Goldman Sachs? During the counterparty negotiations? Yeah, I, no, no, I didn't. There, you never there, called him? There's, as I said, the former, uh, his chief of staff, I think the person you're referring to. Well, we what, didn't know what, about what, it until today. Is someone who became his chief of staff when he became Treasury Secretary after I had left no, office. No, but he said that while he was uh, at the Federal Reserve, he, 
He was his chief of staff. I, That's what he said today. I don't believe that was the case. Okay, but, all right. But in any event, when he was, when, when Tim okay, was Okay, let me the, just go on. I have the time. I talked with Tim. Here's the problem that I think a lot of us are having. Mr. Geithner said he was not involved with the counterparty negotiations. You're saying you didn't, you were, you were not involved. Oh, yes, you heard a little bit about it. But on November 6th, when they gave $62 billion to all these parties who came in and looted AIG, all you guys say, I knew nothing about it. And yet it appears that this happened. Now, recently, Michael McWraith, who's director of the National Association of Insurance Commissioner, told the Senate Banking Committee, he said, you know, if AIG had gone in bankruptcy, we would have taken care of it. It would have been an orderly disposition. This is what he said. AIG's insurance operations and their other companies would have simply, we would have simply bought up AIG's insurance assets, allowing a seamless delivery of AIG's insurance obligation. So the question is, considering that the state insurance commissioners would likely have seized AIG's insurance subsidiaries, protected policy holders in an AIG bankruptcy, why was it necessary to bail out AIG with taxpayers' money, based upon the testimony of the director of the National Association of Insurance Commissioners? I respectfully disagree with him, and I believe that if So you this, disagree with this guy with I, all his I, knowledge I, and his years I, of experience? I will just say many people with years of experience had some regulatory responsibilities with regard to AIG, but this company was a, had a huge problem, and it is case number one on what is wrong with our regulatory system. There was no single regulator that had a line of sight on the total company. So there were regulators that looked at different pieces of it, and if the company had gone down, it, it would have been a huge mess. Is your testimony, Mr. Guyton, sort of implied, he scares members of Congress, he scares the public, we are all scared. He said if AIG was not bailed out, this country would have collapsed. He intimated our Constitution would not have been able to be enforced. There would be a revolution in this country. Do you think it's at that extreme? If we let AIG go bankrupt, we would have had that kind of collapse uh, I, and uh, revolutionary spirit in this country? Is that I, what your I, position is today? I, I certainly have never said that. But what I He implied that. What, what, what I've said is I believe we would have had an absolute economic disaster. And our system gentlemen, of gentlemen, government. Gentlemen's time has expired. Gentlemen's time has expired. I uh, will now recognize the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Kucinich. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, Secretary Paulson. Thank you for being here today. Now, in your testimony, you state that in your capacity as United States Treasury Secretary, you were not involved in any decisions with respect to payments to AIG's counterparties, and that you were not involved in any of the decisions concerning AIG's disclosure of those payments. I, I'd like to accept that at face value. Uh, Mr. Paulson, except the critical decisions concerning payments to counterparties were made after the passage of the Emergency Economic Recovery Act by Congress at your request. And the uh, Emergency Economic Recovery Act made the Treasury Secretary responsible for the use of funds authorized by Congress. Negotiations on the counterparty payments by the Federal Reserve Bank of New York did not begin until November 6, 2008, and the funding of the payment of the counterclaims was backed by funds made available under the Emergency Economic Recovery Act. So, Mr. Paulson, uh, doesn't it make it your responsibility to, to know how those funds were used? I, I think you will find, uh, Congressman, and I think SIGTARP reported this, that the TARP investment, the $40 billion TARP investment, was equity, and that those funds did not go into this maiden lane vehicle uh, where, where the, 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 Fed, the, the Fed loan. So, so you went. didn't have any knowledge of the counterparty I, 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 I uh, transa no. payment transactions? I, I, I did not. Are you not. telling us that? I, I did not. And are you telling us that uh, you were not aware of, of any of the discussions? leading to the counterparty payments with any of the principals. You weren't Th that's what I'm telling you. And you're telling us that as Treasury Secretary, you had no role whatsoever in the decision on counterparty payments, that you didn't even, you didn't ask anyone any questions, that you never expressed an opinion on the matter, that you were completely unaware of the nature of proposed transactions until it was consummated, and no one asked you any questions about how these Emergency Economic Stabilization uh, Act 
or the Recovery Act funds uh, would be used to stabilize AIG, the one financial institution more than any other that was at the well, heart of the crisis. You just well, didn't well, know. Well, uh, uh, con Congressman, we asked a lot of questions about the $40 billion TARP equity investment. That was that, that was something that was that was that was our job and it was our authority. Did you ask and about as, the nature and, of the and, and as, I, and as I said, the the loan that was a Fed authority, and they had the authority and the technical expertise to handle that, and that was that, that was their job, and we were consumed with other matters, and had great confidence in them to carry out their responsibilities very professionally and well. Well, uh, you know, Mr. Paulson, uh, no one disputes that you worked very hard throughout the crisis. Uh, it's well known. You were personally talking with senior executives at every, all major financial institutions uh, on your now legendary cell phone, which I might add uh, is, uh, in the, is in the Museum of American uh, History. Uh, but how is it that you played no role in the, in the handling of this AIG relief, that you didn't have an interest in it. I, how is it that despite Goldman Sachs' extensive role as a counterparty to an agent for AIG in the transaction, your extensive personal network of associations within Goldman, which extended to several Goldman alumni on staff at Treasury, that you can say that you didn't have any knowledge and by implication no influence over the transaction. I, I don't understand that. Well, I, I can, it can't be any clearer. I had, I, I uh, assumed that Goldman Sachs knew that Goldman Sachs and I assumed most other major uh, financial institutions were counterparties, but I had no knowledge of what the individual claims were. And that was my concern here was not about uh, counterparty claims when we uh, rescued AIG. My, my, my concern was about what was going to happen to the American economy and the American people. And again, you, you need to understand when we worked together, uh, the Fed and Treasury, we had different authorities, different responsibilities, and there was so much going on I, that we, we had a lot to do, and they had the authority and responsibility for dealing with the loan and The thing that I have trouble with, though, is that the government gave Goldman Sachs, your former firm, a better deal than it had a right to expect. You heard the previous testimony here. I, I just, it, it's mystifying how you, as Treasury Secretary, this could happen and you not really know anything about it. And uh, did you, if, unless you recused yourself from any discussions about AIG? I didn't or about to, uh, Goldman Sachs. I didn't have to recuse myself because mm. the fact was no one discussed it with me, consulted it w w with me. Uh, I was involved in other matters. This was a, this was a Federal Reserve Authority, and they had the technical expertise, and that was their yeah. job. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Paulson. Thank you. No, I'm saying we have votes on the floor, and of course um, uh, well, we uh, have four votes, and that we, uh, due to a previous agreement with Mr. Paulson, that we're now going to uh, allow him to go. Uh, Mr. And, Chairman, yeah, be, yeah, could we ask if Mr. Paulson could stay just for five more minutes to complete on our side? Two people will split time. Uh, two? Well, let me put it this way then. Now, who, who has not had an opportunity to? Is one, two, three. Right. Mr. Paulson. Mr. Paulson. Could you give us uh, another seven minutes and let me split three and a half uh, and three and a half? Yeah, okay. okay. We, we can look at it. Mr. Okay. Chairman, yeah. well, I would be willing to put mine in writing to Secretary Paulson if he'd be willing to respond within a certain given time right. rather than. Yeah, Mr. Secretary, uh, yes. Well, Mr. Well, Mr. Secretary, there's, there's um, uh, a request in terms of uh, if we give the questions to you in writing, yes, you will respond. We, we, we will get back to you. Thank you, thank you very much. Okay. Uh, yes. Uh, uh, Mr. Paulson, you uh, were. Let's see how we're going to break this down first. You, you were know, one of the chief operating uh, officers of Goldman. Yield? Would gentlemen yield?
You're going to give us additional seven, eight minutes? Uh, is it okay? Okay, good. All right, so we'll break it down. It, four. You, you were, okay. you were one of the top. be eight minutes, right? Yeah. Right, eight minutes. You were one of the top officers for Goldman Sachs, right? Uh, yes, the top yeah. officer. And some of the people that work for Goldman Sachs want to work for Mr. Geithner? Uh, I, 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 I believe I know. Yeah. And when you, when you left Goldman Sachs and went to the Treasury, you were there three years and you got $200 million in tax benefits. Uh, because you didn't have to pay capital gains on $500 million worth of stock, right? I would strongly disagree with that. Because, well, that's what's been because, reported. Because, l l let me just exp okay, exp well, l it's okay. okay. You, can re you can respond. I I'll send a question to you in writing. Okay. The, the concern I have is the same concern that Mr. Stearns has. You came before our conference very nervous, saying, oh, my gosh, the sky's falling. We've got to come up with this money very, very quickly. And you actually were visibly nervous when you came before our caucus. And then we have this bailout uh, of uh, AIG, and uh, you, you don't know anything about it. Mr. Geithner had nothing to do with it. It just really boggles the mind that some of the biggest people involved in this whole thing from beginning to end had nothing to do with it. They didn't know. It, was some, I, it makes you want to think that some clerk someplace was making these decisions. I don't think anybody's going to buy that. You and Mr. Geithner and others were directly involved in making this decision, were you not? Of course, we are directly involved, and I, I, I said it in my testimony. I heard uh, Mr. Geithner's testimony. I heard him say the same thing. We, we were, I, I was very supportive of that decision uh, of to, to, to uh, prevent the failure of AIG. Go to gentleman who's next on this on my side, Mr. Lynch. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Two minutes. Right. Mr. Secretary, I need to make this uh, happen in two minutes. Uh, you were centrally involved with the negotiations regarding Bear Stearns when uh, you insisted on a very, very low price on the part of the, uh, the Bear Stearns shareholders uh, in order to protect the taxpayer. Uh, it has been reported that you, you were very supportive of a $2 a share price. Uh, in order to protect the, the share, excuse me, to protect the taxpayer's interest. And yet, in, in this situation with AIG, and, and you were the CEO of Goldman Sachs back in 2006, there was a long standing relationship there between AIG and Goldman Sachs that you were well aware of. Goldman Sachs was a major uh, counterparty on a lot of these credit default swaps. Uh, with AIG when you were the CEO at Goldman, and that relationship continued after you left. You would have known that these people were, were uh, that, that Goldman was exposed here with these credit default swaps when the money went from the taxpayer to AIG and through to your, your former company. And, and I guess the question that everybody has here is why, when you insisted on on Bear Stearns taking a big haircut, why did you allow Goldman to be reimbursed, your former company, at 100 cents on a dollar in that situation? Well, why did you not weigh in on behalf of the taxpayer? As I've said a number of, on a number of occasions, I did not know, I had no knowledge of the size of the claim of any bank and I had no involvement in the decision to make payments to the counterparties, none whatsoever. I was very supportive of the rescue of AIG because a failure of that uh, company would have been disastrous. Especially to Goldman Sachs. It, it gentleman's been, time has expired. It would have been disastrous to the American people. Gentleman's time has expired. I now yield uh, two minutes to the gentleman from Ohio, Thank you, Mr. Jordan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Paulson, I want to clarify the chain of events surrounding the original request for the TARP dollars, original request of Congress. You came to the Congress, everyone in this committee, I think everyone in Congress would admit, you came to us in September said, we need the, we, we need the money to buy troubled assets, toxic assets. As everyone knows, at some point you changed your mind. When did you change your mind and decide you weren't going to purchase the troubled assets, you were going to inject capital into the banks? When did that happen? I Changed my mind. I, I came to Congress on September 18th. Congress it, first voted it down. It, it, it October took, 3rd, we voted it was, for it. When, did you, when did you change it was your mind? Our, it was our strategy when I came to Congress to buy 
illiquid assets, purchase illiquid assets. When, I, we two, got two minutes. Two when did you change on, your mind? And it was, but by the time. Before the vote on October 3rd or after uh, the vote, when I, did you change your mind? I had begun considering putting, uh, putting a, a capital into the banks as one option uh, as we got near the final vote, but I had not changed my mind yet on the strategy, and I will say one other thing to you. Right up, even after we put capital in the banks, which we were forced wait, wait, to wait, do wait, by what is it? Did you change your mind before I, the vote or after I, the vote? I because had, we I, have the, te we have well, the interchange. I changed, my mind, I changed my mind after the vote because I, I did not okay. change my can this, I just say this? I did not change my mind on purchasing illiquid assets we have the slide until, until mid to late October after we put the capital in. After we put the capital in. So you're just in. so I'm clear. You're saying you didn't change your mind until after the vote. So I want to I want to point to this the, the book the David Wessel's book that came out in the Fed We Trust page 226 227 and you've just been given a copy of what it says. House of Representatives rejected the Bush administration's bank rescue plan on the 29th of 2008. The next morning. Mr. Paulson ran into Michelle Davis, the spokeswoman and policy coordinator in the Treasury building. Quote, I think we're going to have to put equity in the banks, he said, despite what Paulson had told Congress. Buying toxic assets was going to take too long. Davis gave him a blank stare. Quote, we haven't even gotten the bill through Congress, she remembered thinking. How are we going to explain this, she told her boss. We can't say that now. He took the advice. So, again, I'm asking you, was it before or after? Because you've said two different things. You said, I started thinking about it. But you said, I didn't make the decision until after. But you sold the Congress on the simple fact that you were going to buy the troubled assets. That's why they needed the money. If you would let me and this con your spokeswoman directly contradicts that. Congressman, let me answer the question. Give, give me a minute to answer the question. The, during that period, when Congress was acting, the situation worsened considerably. As we got near the final vote, I was beginning to be clear to me that we were going to need to think through other options. But no, long after, even after we put capital in the banks. Did you express okay, that concern to the Congress? The gentleman's time has expired. It, even after we put capital in the banks, it was still my intent to proceed with an illiquid asset purchase program until we got into late October. Let me ask you one question. Is that, is that I'm sorry, is the statement time on the screen is, accurate, Mr. Chairman? I think it's, a, I think it's important for the is committee expired. to know that. I now yield two minutes to the gentleman from Maryland, Mr. Holland. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Paulson. And I accept your testimony that failure to act, uh, in, enact the financial rescue plan would have uh, led to, as you said, uh, economic uh, disaster. Uh, when you and the uh, President, President Bush, came before the Congress uh, in, in, in an emergency, you submitted a plan that did not include at the time a mechanism to make sure that the taxpayer would recoup any dollars that had been extended uh, to the financial sector. Uh, the Congress at that time inserted a provision uh, requiring the President, whoever that President may be, uh, to submit a plan to recover those funds on behalf of the taxpayer. Uh, President Obama has now done that in proposing a fee. And my question to you is, do you agree that given everything the taxpayer did to save the financial industry, then in addition to taking measures to prevent this from happening in the future, we should also make sure that we put in place a mechanism to recover the monies that went to Wall Street and other financial banks as part of the rescue. I, I, I do agree with that. And, but the, the, the provision that was put into the TARP legislation envisioned, contemplated, looking at a five-year window and at the end of that five-year time period, if, if the uh, taxpayer hadn't recovered the money, then there was going to be a, a, a tax. Now, today, as I look at the circumstance, the money is going to come back from the banks, in my judgment, with a profit to the taxpayer. And it's too early to tell about whether, to, to what extent the money is going to come back from the rest of the program. I frankly think uh, the, the taxpayers will end up being pleasantly surprised and much more will come back. So my only question about the fee, the, the, the tax that's being suggested is, is it too soon to make that judgment, number one? But most importantly, I don't want that to take our focus off of dealing with what is a real problem. We better but, fix this system but, so it doesn't happen But again. would you agree there should be a mechanism in place at, to ensure that at the end of the day, the taxpayer is recoups 100 yeah, percent of the target. Yeah, that was that was Thank the intent of, of Congress, and I think right. it was the right thing to do. I agree. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Paulson.
Um, thank you, Mr. Paulson, Excuse for. Me, Congressman, uh, yes. woman, I, I had agreed to stay for uh, a, another eight minutes. It's been ten minutes. <laughs> for that reason, okay. uh, I um, dismissed the gentleman who had who had the time to tell him his time had passed. And I would, and, and for the committee, and especially for Chairman Towns, uh, may I thank you for not only eight minutes, but ten minutes. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> We'd like to call the third panel.